Welcome to episode 282 of the Help Me With HIPAA podcast. My name is David Sims of HIPAA for MSPs and Security First IT, and joining me is Donna Grindel of CardenHQ.com. <laughs> I didn't know you paid attention to which episode it was unless I told you which one it was. I know. Even though it's on your notes. Sometimes I shock you. I know. Just keep me on my toes. Yep. yep. I hear you. So uh, how's things going in the Carden world? Um, I'm like a hamster on a wheel. I keep yeah. thinking I'm going to get to, you know, slow down, but then, you know, the wheel needs to turn some more so that things keep moving. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we're kind of coming to a close of 2020. I think people are finally realizing that all the problems aren't going to go away on December 31st. <laughs> yeah, no, everybody's trying to cram it in. Uh, you know, there's yeah. half, half the people are like, Let's just get into 2021. The other people are going like, I just wish 2019 would come back. <laughs> Let's just, you know, do over. It's kind of like when they, uh, you know, the poor folks up in uh, New York with the big Rockefeller Center tree, you know? Yeah. I don't know if you saw the, the unveiling of the tree. And uh, it, somebody, <laughs> I saw somebody post the video and, on brand 2020 or something like that because they stood the tree up and like it, it's a really pitiful tree <laughs> it's a pitiful tree and now they're all like quit making fun of the tree but it's like it should be that way yeah <laughs> it should be that way you just got to go with that they, they should just put the charlie brown tree out there oh it the looks one. like it. <laughs> it the bottom part of this tree <laughs> You just got to go find the video and watch them stand that thing up and let go. And it's like, oh, my God. <laughs> wow. Yeah. I you have know, to do you that. expect this big, beautiful tree and it, it didn't, it didn't, it didn't expose itself like that. It was more like. <laughs> so I went to, I went to the North Carolina mountains uh, this past weekend and I'm, I'm noticing a phenomenon that seems to be happening mostly at restaurants, but it seems that any restaurant that has any figurine type thing sitting outside, yeah, it has a mask on. So all the wooden yeah. Indian, Indians had masks. <laughs> the yeah. wooden bears had masks. Everything, everything. <laughs> it's yes. like yeah, every little you know statue, statuette. <laughs> Mm -hmm. had a mask on <laughs> i saw somebody even the elf on the shelf now comes with a mask yeah, and, no. uh but you know get the point across whatever it takes uh you know at least the the wooden bear will be <laughs> yeah yeah i had a lady uh, told me a lady told me yesterday that um somebody 20 years younger than her asked her out on a date and she's like these masks are great <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's a good one. Uh, I'm gonna have to remember that. I'm wearing a mask. Yeah, it's funny. We um, uh, we took a group picture yesterday, and you know, <laughs> and I was like, "Y'all got some ugly smiles." <laughs> <laughs> the, but you go into a, a group setting, and everybody's looking at everybody, going, "Okay, do I recognize this person?" Because you you know, really, the only identifiers you have are the eyes, the hair, and the ears. Yeah. Uh, it's so funny, but uh, anyway, uh, we did as of today release the next HIPAA boot camp information. Yeah, it's out on the website. It 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 may not be perfect, but you can register mm -hmm. at the HIPAA dot com, and you say register, uh, and it takes you to the page, or you can go to help me with HIPAA dot com slash h b c. What's that stand for? <laughs> <laughs> That's for those uh, people who can't spell HIPAA properly. Just <laughs> there you go. <laughs> HBC. So we're set for February 23rd, 24th, 25th in a virtual HIPAA boot camp. We're making some changes. We even talked yesterday to the folks that were in the other one about some of the things that we were doing and what you know they want. Um, so all of the, our plans. Uh, seem to be going in line with what they wanted to do and their thoughts. So we're real excited about where we're going. And, uh, you know, I'm always a fan of 
getting input to all of the things that we built at Carden, those have all been based on clients saying, I need this. Uh, okay, I'll go build it. And uh, unlike, I think you will need this in the future, hmm. mm -hmm. which is the way it felt when I built it in what 2012. And everybody's like, no, I don't need it. But you do, Blanche. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah there is that yeah so at least everybody now is starting to realize uh, no matter what uh in industry you may be in this cybersecurity stuff has got to be a thing so anyway yeah. good news you know we're going to move forward and we're looking at doing maybe one other in the fall maybe in august again um for 2021 so if you want in definitely february and uh you know you can be isolated then so it'd be perfect. and uh go to the hippo boot camp all well, right for more do. information just send us an email because that's what most people do anyway hey <laughs> will you tell me about that <laughs> and we're fine with that we yeah are. This all is right true. then all right well we're going to jump into um our topic of the day in just a minute, we're going to talk about information blocking. You know, yes. you brought that up in the last episode. So I guess you felt compelled to talk about it this episode. I said coming soon to an episode near you. And you weren't lying. It was pretty soon. Before we get into the information blocking, we don't want to block the information for our segment of the week, the HIPAA. Say what? All right. <laughs> so, um, it, it OCR is on a roll, you know. No, this They're is on the a roll, 18th man. case, 18th have, enforcement action in 2020. We have, um, you know, 12 days of Christmas, and now there's <laughs> the 12 enforcements <laughs> of Christmas. I must, there probably be more, though. I do expect there to be more than 12. I know. Uh, but, you know, uh, they, they say their point, they're trying to get people to, you know, take it seriously. Yeah. So tell us about number 12, because uh, there's there's a little bit of some new um, information. There's just some comments that were made in the uh, the cap that I you know got my attention anyway. So I wanted to make sure that we all recognize that HIPAA does say these things. Um, I think that we've mentioned uh, about 150 times that you need to get your ducks in a row with patient right of access. Mm -hmm. If you are a patient, then you need to understand what your rights are. And if you are a provider or a vendor that deals with patient medical record access, you need to get your ducks in a row because they're all done with this. And uh, so this one is the University of Cincinnati Medical Center. The University of Cincinnati Medical <laughs> Center. So... <laughs> They, uh, you know, it's, it's a teaching hospital, right? So you would think that they would have, everybody always says, well, you know, they have all these resources. They have all their stuff together. Not so much. No. <laughs> uh, so this one again from last year, May 2019, they got a complaint. I was alleging, because remember these settlements, you don't admit guilt. Right. Right. You just settle so that they're not going to. Uh, do the civil money penalty. So uh, alleging that the medical center failed to respond to a patient's uh, request from February 2019. And uh, they requested uh, that they send an electronic copy of her medical records maintained in the EHR to the lawyers. I think there was a malpractice thing going on. Um <laughs> And these are just not good practices at all. OCR initiated an investigation, said, yeah, you didn't do that. And uh, we need you to follow that the patient has a right to get an electronic copy and uh, have it transmitted to a third party. They have the right to do that. And uh, <laughs> finally, in August 2019, the patient got their records. So, um, Roger's quote, which, because I didn't copy it into the notes, you 
are limited in your ability to do the uh, reading as you normally would. I know. So if I put the notes up for you, uh, that's that's always the best way for me is <laughs> to make sure that you can do things on your own. And uh, so we're going to we're going to make it where David can read all by himself. The <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, here you go, David. Can you read that? Oh, wow. <clears throat> Let me move some yes, windows no. out of the way. <laughs> 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 All right. So uh, this is uh, Roger Severino's quote. He says, OCR is committed to enforcing patients' rights to access their medical records, including the right to direct electronic copies to a third party of their choice. HIPAA covered entities should review their policies and training programs to ensure they know and can fulfill all their HIPAA obligations whenever a patient seeks access to his or her records. And, you know, the last time it was like, we're going to keep doing this until they get the point. And, um, so I'm not quite sure what happened between them getting the records in August 2019 and this uh, settlement being announced, but clearly it was a, uh, a moment. Uh, you know, it's been a minute between mm -hmm. the times. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they say. So uh, obviously there's a monetary settlement, $65,000, which is, you know, pretty high for one of these. They're not hitting you hard on the money. They want you on the two-year corrective action plan. Right. That's what we always say. They want you on these corrective action plans. And I find it interesting that, you know, they're coming out and saying it's this big bunch of money, or you can go for the smaller amount of money in a two-year corrective action plan where we're going to oversee your program. Mm -hmm. And let me just say that, I'm pretty sure the lawyers try first <laughs> to not go into the corrective action plan because we talked about how big of a deal these are. So two years of oversight and you've got to uh, supply all these details and you've got time frames, and it does change the way you look at your program. You know what I'm saying? I do. And so their two-year corrective action plan, obviously most of these have focused on making sure that you have the patient right of access details in place and that you're doing uh, the proper written policies and procedures. Hello. Not just, we will give patients their medical records. <laughs> <laughs> How would you do that? <laughs> <laughs> And who's responsible for making sure and all those kind of things. So um, these are the things that they'll focus on in the first 30 days is making sure that they have revamped these policies and procedures. They send them in, they get approval or they update them accordingly. And then they have a commitment that they have to distribute it to all of their staff, which, you know, these policies and procedures they've changed. But then you have a little item here that says that they will assess and update and revise as necessary policies and procedures at least annually or as needed. And that as you revise them, you'll send them in to OCR for review. So not only do you need to do it, but you're going to need to show us that you've done it. Mm -hmm. And you're going to need to make sure that you distribute those policy changes to all of your staff and relevant business associates. And I found this little note and relevant business associates and shall require new compliance certifications. Huh. What I think they're talking about is attestations uh, more so than certifications of, uh, cause we all know there's not really a certification. What they're looking for is that confirmation that you uh, have received it and you understand it. I believe is what they're saying there, but the word uh, compliance certification, that, that kind of threw me for a loop to see that in one of these. And I think it was just a, you, you have everybody going, see, there is a certification. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what it is. I don't know where it is. I don't know how to get it, but they mentioned it. Right? Yeah. And they mentioned it with business associates. 
Um, but you know, it's, it's at the end of that long list of all workforce members and all of that. So I just found that odd. And I'm going to send in a question. Maybe, I don't know. In the minimum content of policies and procedures, though, I did note um, a couple of things that you don't normally see. And one, and this is one of those things that HIPAA talks about, and then people are like, what? It is an accurate definition of a designated record set as defined in the privacy rule. Mm, okay. They have to make sure they have one. And if you go ask somebody, do you have a defined, you know, what is your definition of a designated record set? They're like, the records? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, you know, because everybody keeps different records on file. So you have to define in your environment, you know, what constitutes your designated record set so that they're all accounted for and dealt with. And when a patient asks for their records, your designated record set is what's included. Makes sense. Okay. Most people, if they have the policy, it's from a template that says, you know, we'll define a def designated record set. And then somewhere it just says, you know, boilerplate kind of language. And uh, so it's a process we go through when we're doing our policy and procedure solution because it's like, what you mean you, you, you don't, you don't have a designated record set. They're making it clear here. You should have an accurate definition of a designated record set because that directly relates to making sure that the patient gets access to all of their medical records in the designated record set. Mm -hmm. They're supposed to give it to all of them. And then you have uh, standard procedures for responding to requests for access, which Okay, that's what we keep telling you you need to have. It's not this person told that person told that person told that person. <laughs> Everybody follows the same list and checklist and make sure it's followed every time. And, you know, we talk about checklists a lot. But for some reason, people, when I say checklist, they think of it as a to-do list. Yeah. You know? And it's not. The to-do list item is to give this patient their records. The <laughs> checklist is to make sure I did that to-do item properly. And I, I, you know, I had a conversation with a friend of mine about why don't you use a checklist? Well, I have all that. But then when I like, okay, my to-do item is to post the podcast. But I have a checklist because I do pieces and parts and I get distracted a fly could go by and I have a checklist to make sure I've done all the things I realized this week. I need to update the checklist. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot something and it's not on the checklist, but I'm constantly updating my policies and procedures. Thank you very much. Yeah. And that's one of those things that they're saying standardize it and make sure everybody's doing the same thing. And then of course the training and the training needs to cover the business associates involved in receiving and fulfilling the request. And I think that's a big gap, huge gap for a ton of people between I hire a business associate to handle this for me and the business associate actually is, you know, understands what the rules are because they signed a BAA. Not enough. Right. Right. And then they have to have protocols for training that are involved in the maintaining of designated record sets and other PHI. So there's a note there, designated record set doesn't necessarily mean all PHI, but I think a lot of people see it that way. Mm -hmm. So that kind of loops back around. And then I thought this was kind of interesting. Application of appropriate sanctions against workforce members who fail to comply with policies and procedures, all policies and procedures. Uh, the sanction policy, we run into a lot, you know, and we, you remember when we talk about that in the boot camp, we talk about the sanction policy and the importance of it. Yeah. And everybody's like, well, everybody knows I shouldn't do it. Okay. But what does your sanction policy say? Well, that you could be fired for violating HIPAA. Yeah, that's not good enough. 
<laughs> no, and you want to make it both subjective and objective, mm-hmm. right? You, you need to make it where there's certain things that you follow this, and then there's some personal decisions that can be made. Right. Because nobody likes fire anybody. Yeah. We're going to fire everybody that violates him. <laughs> Except the doctor. We're not going to fire him. We're not going to do anything to him. But, you know, again, there's the case where somebody went and said, uh, you couldn't fire me because your rule just said I could be fired for violating HIPAA. It didn't make clear that the thing I did would be the thing that would do it. Right. And so, you know, we have a matrix that we built with the ability to, you know, here's your levels. And at some point, there's no more subjective to it. You got to go. Mm hmm. Uh, I thought this was an interesting thing because it didn't focus on privacy rights or patient access rights. Rather, it focused on all policies and procedures. Yeah, that is uh, interesting. <laughs> so it, having a proper and and I assure you a proper sanction policy is not you could be fired if you violate these rules. Right. That's not, not going to cut it. Yeah, that's. Too ambiguous. <laughs> ambiguous. I like it. Ambiguous. Yeah. Well, lawyers like amb- ambiguity too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they do. All uh, right. And then a process for reviewing business associate performance with regard to access requests and responses and sanctioning business associates who fail to permit the medical center to comply with its policies and procedures. Oh, all right, David. Now you need to listen to that one. That's interesting. Yeah. If you don't permit them to meet their obligations under HIPAA, Mm -hmm. then you should be sanctioned as a vendor. That brings up a whole nother matrix. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Well, and how do you just, you know, Oh, well, you know, David, uh, somebody was allowed to log in with somebody else's username. You are not allowing me to meet my obligation, so I now can get out of my contract. Yeah, what kind of sanctions are you putting on a business associate? You don't have a lot of yeah. options there. Well, mostly I could see it, you know, particularly with these uh, right of access cases. Mm-hmm. Of any, you know, there is a penalty on what your payment will be if there is a problem. Yeah, it it had to be and, monetary. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, because that's the relationship. Three days off right? without pay. <laughs> <laughs> I still want that. You know, I wish somebody would do that. Anyway, uh, I thought that those were all quite interesting and um, a little bit different than what we're used to seeing. And with that in mind, I was like, "Yeah, HIPAA does say all of that." HIPAA say what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, I found it really really interesting that you know some of the way those things are phrased matters mm-hmm. so i'm gonna have to look into the uh, compliance certification i think what they're referring to is confirmation they understand but <clears throat> it didn't sound that way. yeah it, it was gray and you usually don't see that <laughs> anyway so david be Find prepared out. For your sanction policies from your clients. Yeah. Um, We don't stop them from doing anything they should be doing. We're often stopping them from things they shouldn't be doing. (laughs) So uh, if anything, I should have a sanction policy against my clients. I know, right? Yeah. When you do this, we are going to charge you more money. Well, that's why a lot of uh, business associates now are making sure that in their BAAs, you know, because it always says, in the downstream contract, if you're not following HIPAA, then I have rights to terminate our agreements. Right. Right. You know, regardless of what your SLA may say, I have the right because you're agreeing here, you're going to do this. And if you're not, Mm -hmm. peace out. Yeah. Um, But the thing is that it didn't have language going the other way. Right. And a lot of folks are putting in their language going the other way because you could bring me down mm-hmm. with you, right? If you're not following it and then there's a problem, I could easily, as a vendor, get thrown under the bus, even though I'm trying to get you to do this. Yeah. 
I mean, fortunately for us, we don't, you know, clients don't come to us and, and say, we need you to release records to somebody yeah. uh, or do something. So we don't get called in, in that. So I'm there not sure. Plenty of vendors though that. Yeah. So I'm not sure if that, yeah. if that would apply to us in any form I could well, see. It would if you, I mean, you don't bring in clients that aren't willing to do the security work. Right. right? Mm -hmm. That's why they hire a security company. Mm -hmm. But if you're, you know, the average IT provider and you have people that are refusing to follow HIPAA and, you know, you know, they're refusing. If you truly understand it, <laughs> you know, it doesn't mean you get to go out on a forum and learn about HIPAA and now go out and tell your clients how it works. No, I learned at the University of Facebook. <laughs> If you regularly listen to this podcast or been to the boot camp, any of those things, you know, spend the time getting actual training on what it says. You know, there are some times where you may want to be able to trigger that in the mm -hmm. agreement. Yeah. All right. So we got to go quick here uh, on the last little bit on information blocking. Okay. And it's not that I want to dig a deep, deep dive into it but I want to make sure that we start talking about it. Do you have some shoulder pads you can wear? Yeah. Helmet. Yeah. I'm going to be doing some blocking Just information, blocking <laughs> information. Uh, no. Yeah. Uh, so, um, yeah, I can think of a lot of times in my life whenever I've had to do information blocking, mm -hmm. <laughs> especially going through a divorce, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and <laughs> when it comes to patient information, we can't do that anymore. Nope. And, uh, that was part of, uh, it's part of what happened, uh, in last week's episode, we talked about information blocking coming from some yeah. people. Uh, and crazy. so that was mentioned in this, uh, lawsuit that's being filed requesting a class action in Florida with, uh, Bay health and Psyox, I think. Mm-hmm. But they mention information blocking because that's becoming a thing. And um, I love it that somebody sent a thing uh, to uh, me saying, we want somebody to talk about information blocking. And we figure if anybody knows about it, it's you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> uh, you know, but here's the thing. It's not HIPAA. It's right. very HIPAA adjacent. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Yes. They're touching. They, they touch, but they don't cross pollinate, but they do, but they don't. Yeah. So here's the thing. The 21st Century Cures Act that was signed in December 2016. So this stuff's been going on. And it's been slowly building. But the big thing that it was about is promoting innovation, interoperability, those kind of things. And the way that you do that is to make sure all these disparate systems everywhere can talk to each other. You know, there's still a lot of sneaker net going on mm -hmm. where that machine over there, I take the data off of it on some sort of, uh, you know, USB stick and I bring it over here and I put it in or, I, you know, the patient gets their data and then they take it with them. There's not a lot of full interaction between most of these systems. And a lot of that has to do with the vendors. You know, the vendors have, uh, it's to their advantage to keep you from talking to other systems, because if I can send information to other systems, then I could technically send everything you have to another system if you wanted to switch. Mm -hmm. And I could also charge you a bunch of money for doing interfaces. And that the big flaw in interoperability, plus folks did a lot of things that were proprietary. So there's, there's a long list of uh, healthcare IT issues, and this is designed to kind of put a kibosh on that. And it's got two pieces, which is the certification, and there's probably a little bit more, but what we're going to worry about is the certification of healthcare IT now has to include controls on information blocking and a standardized API using HL7 FHIR which fire has been the solution to things, you know, for a lot of people that are big proponents of it, mm -hmm. you know, they really think a lot of it and, uh, you know, see it as solving a lot of problems. For me, 
I'm a data interface person. That's what I've always done. I love it. I'm excited about this because I see it opening up so many channels because, you know, we'll have a standard. Even when we had the, um, you know, we had the, uh, what it was, National NSF, National Standard Framework for Claims. It was not standard. The only thing that was standard was the names of the records and the things you could put on them. But how you filled them out was different for every payer. Mm -hmm. So there was no standard, really. You still had a different set of code in, in there somewhere to deal with each payer's requirement. For example, a referring physician could be put in, in, in the file like six places maybe. Okay, well, this payer to pay this kind of claim wants it in one and four. To pay another kind, don't put it in four, put it in six. If you put it in four and six and one, it's getting re – I mean, it was crazy. So they're trying to reduce that, reduce that, reduce that. Anyways, with all that in mind, that's the big part of it, an API, an advanced program interface that basically says, I'm going to have a language that I will carry on conversations with other systems. Which means all the security people are going to have to secure all of those open API connections. Mm hmm the good news about fire is the traffic itself is encrypted, which is not included in other HL7. So there's a lot of things that are big deal about it. It's great. I think it's going to be a very big help to innovation and to reduce workload. A lot of administrative stuff could be solved if they implement these things properly. Right. Right. I think it's awesome. But then again, there's the implement it properly thing. <laughs> Always challenge. Uh-huh. Yeah. And so information blocking is another piece of that that says I can't make it hard to uh, get information, let's just say. So anything that I as a, a provider uh, or a vendor of any sort, whether it's an HIE or health network or whatever, if I'm doing something – from let's say I implement a non-standard kind of technology. And then I said, well, I can't connect to that because I'm using, you know, something written by Joe Blow. Mm -hmm. Then that's information blocking. I am purposely not using an industry standard connection, which limits my, my ability to then share information. Or I am making a decision not to give information to people or I'm making a decision to limit my designated record set, or I'm making, you know, those kinds of things are information blocking. And if I'm charging more than what would be a reasonable amount, a reasonable profit to do these uh, kind of connections, then that is considered information blocking because I'm making it not cost effective. So there's a long list that gets evaluated on what information blocking is. Technically, it also applies to providers. But there's one big trick here. There are penalties if you're involved in information blocking. Up to, you know, the same thing they do with HIPAA. Up to a million dollars per violation. Right. <laughs> Ooh. You know, and then you never see it, you know, charged that way. But, um. Yes, they, they do do the, they do do legal maneuvers <laughs> uh, to, you know, deal with those numbers. And in that uh, set of, uh, you know, here's how we're going to enforce it. Because we all learned with HIPAA, you know, the first HIPAA 1.0, nobody enforced it. So, yeah, which is why we have. It. This is why we have hippa schmippa now. <laughs> I know, right? Nobody enforced it, you know. So, and that's why it got the way it is. And HIPAA two point people started to get the idea that it was going to be enforced. We're on HIPAA three point now. Mm -hmm. It is being enforced down to very specific issues. And uh, so, <clears throat> but here's the thing: is that this is again, this is not this is the HIPAA adjacent thing, meaning the patient right of access, which we've been talking about. I can't block patients' ability to share that information, get access to that information, have electronic copies of that information. Okay, but primarily, you know, a lot of the vendors are like angry at the providers because they're not doing this. The providers really have no control 
on how their systems can work. Right. The vast majority of them, either they can't afford these super expensive connections for doing this one thing that won't say, you know, they won't get any kind of ROI on it for 10 years. It's just not making sense for them to do that. So the vendors having to participate in this program to have a certified healthcare IT product anymore is huge. So we've got the uh, serious need, but here's the kicker is that if there is a violation, it is, uh, or a complaint filed uh, for anybody that uh, supposedly is doing information blocking, the complaint is investigated by HHS OIG, the Office of Inspector General, not OCR. Two different offices. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they're adjacent. <laughs> <laughs> right across the hall. <laughs> Well, nobody is anymore, right? Yeah. But um, so the way it works, though, is OIG has the legal authority to enforce information blocking rules and API rules on the vendors and the HIEs and all, but they don't have it on providers. If they have a issue and they feel that there is a provider violating information blocking rules, they refer that to HHS to the secretary who is going to determine appropriate disincentives. <laughs> okay. I haven't really seen a good definition of a disincentive. So really and truly, you know, if a, a provider is doing what they're supposed to be doing under patient right of access, if you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, then as far as you're concerned, that information blocking rule shouldn't be a big concern. What should be a big concern is to make sure your vendors are taking action right now. Not we're gonna, but they're doing it now because technically it was supposed to come, it was supposed to uh, in the law written that it became effective November 2nd, 2020. And oh. as you know, on brand for 2020, that got moved down. <laughs> yep. So April 5th, 2021, this is when it's all supposed to come into play. But there's a, you know, an, an extended all the way out through 2023 implementation of all this stuff. So there's the important things for you to know. Any questions, David? Um, no questions. I do think we're going to hear even more about it as we move into 21, all the way through 23. Because, you know, most people are going to wait until... January of 2023. <laughs> yeah. And just know there's like eight different exceptions to the information blocking rule. This gets you, there's a deep dive that there's tons of things that are considered exceptions because why not? Yeah. You know, there's exceptions. Just there's always that. exceptions. Yeah. So interesting. Interesting that it's so prolific <laughs> that they must address it with the adjacent. <laughs> Hippiness. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's correct. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing else to add to that, right? No, that's that's done. That's we're done. <laughs> All right, folks, that is our show for today. Thanks for listening. Make sure you, that you like this episode and share it out to your uh well, people that you know. You don't have to be friends, you know. <laughs> share it out <laughs> on your favorite social media site remember to like share review us we are now on youtube live we've always had the podcast there on youtube but now we're actually on video we're not on, on YouTube. youtube live we are live on youtube oh, <laughs> we are live in the recorded version <laughs> so uh anyway go check it out uh leave a comment below the video that'd be cool give donna something else to do <laughs> And remember, for Donna and myself, HIPAA is not about compliance or information blocking. It's about patient care. Yeah.